In this video, I'm going to cover collision theory. So we know that when we increase the temperature of a substance, we increase its kinetic energy, which causes the particles to travel through space faster. Their translation energy is increased, their um, kinetic energy as they move through space. So um, that has an effect on the rate of chemical reactions. If we change the temperature and we change how quickly the particles are moving through space, then we change the way in which they react when they collide with each other. So this changes, mathematically, it changes the rate constant of the rate law. So remember when we're drawing a rate constant, that all rate constants have the basic form that the rate is equal, excuse me, I'm talking about a rate law, not a rate constant. All rate laws have the general form that the rate is equal to the rate constant times the concentration of A raised to its order times the concentration of B raised to its order and so on and so on. So um, rate laws always look like this and they always have this rate constant. Okay. So um, when we're changing uh, the temperature, we say that changing the temperature changes the rate of a reaction. Well here's the rate of the reaction. Changing the temperature does not change the concentration of the substances. If I heat it up or I cool it down, I still have the same amount of A and B. And heating it up and cooling it down does not change the order of the reaction. It doesn't affect N or M. If it's hot or cold, the reaction will still be first order or second order and so on. So it doesn't affect the order of the reaction. So if temperature affects the rate, and it doesn't affect any of these variables over here, then the way that temperature affects the rate must be tied up in this rate constant. So what does what is the rate constant? Well, the rate constant, uh, Arrhenius discovered this equation, that the rate constant is equal to some factor A, we call the frequency factor, multiplied by E uh, raised to the uh, negative EA and this value right here is called the activation energy divided by R times T and R is the gas constant and T is temperature. So the rate constant we, we've seen already when we looked at rate laws and integrated rate laws that the rate of a reaction is affected by how much stuff I start with, how much A and how much B I start with. That affects the rate of the reaction. Well, now we're going to see how temperature affects it, right? Temperature is now tied up here. T is represented um, in the rate constant. But there's other factors here as well. Now we can start to look at other things that affect the rate. The activation energy affects the rate of a reaction. The temperature affects the rate of a reaction. R is a constant. Um, e is um, just a mathematical function, so we don't, that's not a variable. And A, the frequency factor, has a couple of different uh, mechanistic issues that we'll look at, a couple of uh, components that also will affect how quickly a reaction carries out. So there's lots of things that affect how fast a reaction happens. Concentration is certainly one of them. The order is certainly has an effect on the rate of the reaction. And temperature has an effect on the rate, the activation energy, and this frequency factor. And we'll see there are other things also that have that can affect the rate of a reaction. So let's look at this Arrhenius equation in a bit more detail. So remember R is the gas constant when we looked at gases. And it has different values depending on what units we're going to use. But in this case, we're going to talk about energy. And so the, we'll solve the activation energy in units of joules. And so we'll um, use units of joules in our gas constant. And so when our gas constant has these units, then it has this value. So um, R is just the gas constant. T is the temperature. And we can, as we vary the temperature up and down, that affects the rate constant, which affects the rate. Um, we'll look a bit more here at this activation energy in a minute. Um, and again, the A is the frequency factor. So K, basically what the rate constant is, is the number of collisions that result in a reaction per second. So remember in a first order reaction, the uh, units of the rate constant are per second. So what that means is, is the number of collisions per second that result in a reaction. 
So remember that uh, um, chemicals are kind of uh, just moving around in the volume available to them. And when two reactants collide with each other, kind of like billiard balls on a, on a pool table, when they r collide with each other, if they have enough energy and they're in the, in the right orientation, then a reaction can occur. So the number of collisions that result in a reaction per second, we call that the rate constant. The frequency factor is the number of collisions that whether or not they lead to a reaction per second that occur with the proper orientation to react. So K is the number of reactions or the number of collisions that uh, result in a reaction and A is just the number of appropriate collisions per second. And whether or not those appropriate collisions are going to cause a reaction that's a function of this last one, the exponential term, which says that how much energy is required for that collision to cause a reaction. So the frequency factor has something to do with the way in which they collide with each other. They have to run into each other with the proper orientation. They have to be facing the right way. But not only do they have to be facing the right way, they also have to bump into each other with enough energy for um, bonds to be broken and new bonds to be formed. So this exponential term that has the temperature in it, which tells us how much energy we have available, the activation energy, which tells us how much energy is required for this to happen, this is the probability that any given collision will result in a reaction. So we've seen these reaction coordinate diagrams before, but let's look a little bit more in detail here. So A and B are reactants, and um, the reaction goes A plus B forward arrow makes C plus D. But along the way we reach this spot which is not um, represented in the chemical equation. So when I write the chemical equation for this reaction, A plus B makes C plus D, um, I'm kind of ignoring what's happening in the middle here. And there's a good reason for that, but it's also really important to know what's happening here in the middle. So when A and B run into each other, right? Maybe they have run into each other this much, and then they've run into each other this much. Oops, that's even less. So as they, as they start smashing into each other closer and closer at the right orientation, eventually they're going to uh, hit each other with enough energy to, to, um, to increase the energy of that system all the way up to here, which is what we call the transition state. And at the transition state, um, some bonds are partially broken and other bonds are partially formed. And then at that state, that's when we, we kind of go either one way or the other. We're either going to, um, at the peak here, we're either going to go back to reactants and those product bonds will be broken and we'll move back this way. Or at the peak, the reactant bonds will be broken and the uh, uh, product will move this way and become product. So let's look at an example of, um, of a, a real reaction here so we can see real bonds being formed and broken. So the activation energy is the amount of energy needed to convert reactants into the activated complex and that's also called the transition state and the transition state is just a point at which the bonds that are going to break in the reactant they are almost all the way broken when we've reached the activated complex. We have to add energy to a reactant in order to break that first bond. The amount of energy we have to add to the reactant is called the activation energy. So here's an example of a reaction. In this reaction, this N and C, this is called a nitrile, the nitrile can kind of spin around so that the nitrogen is bonded to the CH3 group or if it spins around, the carbon is bonded to the CH3 group. So this reaction occurs naturally. This group just kind of spins around all by itself and the bonds kind of change like this. So um, while this is happening though, it doesn't happen instantly. So it's not as though the N disappears and in an instant swaps places with the C and the triple bond stays still. It actually um, the triple bond is horizontal here and then for a moment the C is up here and the N is down here and the triple bond is vertical and then the C comes back down here. It, kind of, it literally moves in a circle like the hands of a clock. So um, that information that at one point 
the triple bond is perpendicular to this bond and it's vertical, we don't see that when we just write the full chemical reaction right here. That's called the mechanism, how A turns into B, the specific steps in, while A is on its way to becoming B, that's information that's not included in the chemical equation. So um, that's kind of like this. Here we can see here, this is the reactant, this is the product. But this is kind of like what an activation, an activated complex or transition state starts to look like. It's not quite this and it's not quite this. It's somewhere in the middle because it's this turning into this. And for that to happen, this group, the nitrile group, has to literally spin around in a circle. So the activated complex, the transition state, is like halfway between this reactant turning into a product, at which point the bonds from the reactant, this carbon-nitrogen bond right here, is weak. And this bond right here, from the carbon to the carbon, this bond is starting to form. So this bond is starting to break, and this bond is starting to form. And so it's kind of halfway between being a reactant and halfway being a product. That's what a transition state is. So this here is the reactant. And as it starts moving up here, the N kind of uh, shuffles away from the carbon a little bit. And that makes the energy go up because this bond is breaking. That takes energy. And so if it doesn't have enough energy, if the um, temperature is not very high, and maybe there's not very many collisions happening, and so there's not much energy in the system, then maybe this bond kind of breaks a little bit, but then this bond can't pull all the way around, so this bond breaks a little bit, and then it forms. So what happens is we're sitting down here, the bond breaks a little bit, and then it comes back to where it was. It breaks a little bit, maybe with more energy, and then it comes back to where it was. And then maybe the bond kind of breaks a little bit, but then it comes back to reactant. But then as I start heating this up, then I can, uh, the, every time the bond vibrates, it's going to have more and more energy as I heat it up. And eventually, it's going to have enough energy to get up over the hill. And then that bond will break, and the black atom will start to circle around and make a new bond. And then it'll come down here, and we'll make a new bond for products. All right, so it kind of looks like this. So here's our activation energy got some reactant molecules bouncing around in here. So the height at which these reactant molecules can bounce is a function of their temperature. Because remember how fast they move? That's how, how hot they are. And if they're hot, they move fast. And if they're cold, they move slow. So right now, they're moving about fast enough to get up to about 30, right? They're bouncing up and down, and they can get up to about 30. And we can see that the average temperature here kind of bouncing up and down as the molecules jostle around. They're exchanging energy with each other and with the, the sides of the container. Um, but on average, there's not enough energy here for them to get up over the, the barrier. So if I heat it up, then I'll make the particles move faster. And if they move faster, then when they bump into each other, they're going to have more energy. And when they have more energy and they bump into each other, maybe some of them are going to be able to move over to the product side. So let's heat it up. Oh, we got one. Turned into product. So you can see now there. Oh, and the product turned back into reactant. So, well, that's that's what we call equilibrium. Reactants becoming products and products becoming reactants. So we've uh, we'll talk about that more in the next chapter. But the point that I'm trying to get at here is that. Um, the particles can only get up over the activation barrier and turn into products if there's enough energy in the form of temperature for them to bounce around enough to get up over there. Now, they're not literally bouncing over a barrier here, right? This is a metaphor. But they are, as they get more energy and they bounce into each other, they'll be able to overcome the bonds between particles. So it's not a physical barrier like this that they have to jump over. It's the barrier is the bonds in between the reactant particles that has to break. And the faster they bump into each other, the more likely those particles are to break. So you can see we can actually trap more of the uh, product particles if I make the, uh, the energy difference here greater. So if I have a greater energy difference between reactant and product, then I've, now I've lost all my heat, so I've got to heat up the reactants. 
but if I heat up the reactants now, it should be easier for them to get over to the product side and stay in the product side because there's a greater energy difference. So the, the well down there is much deeper now um, and it's harder for them to get back up over the um, back up over the energy barrier on the reverse reaction. Okay, see it's, it's easier for easier for the reactants to move over there when the energy difference between these two is greater. Also when the activation energy is lower, right? If I lower the activation energy, then they can all just kind of fly over there without any problem. So here's a good example of equilibrium. You can see that now most of the most of the particles have moved over to the product side. Now on average, sure, some of them go back to the reactant side every so often. But now because this is such a deeper well and the energy down here is lower, we would say this product is more stable. And so um, this is kind of just a visual representation of the way that the energy of a reactant and the energy of a product and the activation energy, the barrier involved in breaking that first bond, how those three things are involved in how much reactant there will be at the end of a reaction, how much product there will be at the end of a reaction, and how long it's going to take these balls to bounce up over this barrier, if it has a, a higher activation energy or a lower activation energy. So what's happening in this reaction, we call this the mechanism. The mechanism by which A this reactant turns into B, this product, the mechanism is going through this, in, this activated complex, this transition state. So here we can see that the, the bond between carbon and nitrogen has broken and now it's kind of turned around sideways and now this triple bond is kind of vertical as on its way to flipping around and doing a 180 it kind of has to do a 90 and it has to go this way first. So. Um, in this case, here's what we're seeing. The blue bond has broken, it's flipping this way, and then the blue one is going to pull around all the way back to this side as the, as the two black carbon atoms make a bond down here in the product. So the activated complex is not a reactant and it's not a product. The transition state is halfway. The, react, the, the bonds in the reactant have begun to break. They haven't broken all the way and the bonds in the product have begun to form but they haven't formed all the way. So the transition state has what we call partial bonds. It doesn't have full bonds and it only exists for an instant, a, uh, a picosecond, a femtosecond, an incredibly small amount of time. Um, so small in fact that it's difficult for us to actually see them and measure them when we're looking at chemical reactions. So the transition state is often something that we have to infer. We know that A goes to, we'll call it C for the sake of argument, we know that A goes to C and in order for A to go to C it has to go through B first. So it must go through B if it gets down here. So we infer that this state exists even though it's really really hard for us to see it because it exists for such a short amount of time. So the exponential factor, that's, th that's this factor over here, this is a number between one and zero. And it represents the fraction of each of reactant molecules that have sufficient energy so they can make it over the energy barrier. So we have to know how big the energy barrier is, that's EA. We have to know how much energy is available, that's T. What's the, that, that's the amount of energy that's available, the temperature. So um, the higher the temperature, then the larger the uh, fraction of molecules that have enough energy to make it over the barrier. So the extra energy comes from converting the kinetic energy of motion to potential energy in the molecule when the molecules collide. So these particles are bouncing around with lots of kinetic energy and then when they hit each other, kind of like imagine that the, the particles are um, uh, like cannonballs with a slinky between them or like a spring between them, right? And so we're thinking of these uh, like oxygen molecules that are two atoms that have a bond and the bond is like a spring. 
Well, when these molecules are bouncing around a box, if one of them hits the other in just the right way, it might cause that spring to start vibrating like crazy. It might give it, you know, like a double bounce on a trampoline where you hit it in just the right spot and you can transfer your energy to someone else. Well, if these molecules hit each other in just the right way, they can transfer their, their, the motion, the energy of their motion, their kinetic energy into the motion of that bond vibrating like crazy, vibrating really violently. That's the potential energy. And when that happens, the bond can vibrate so violently that it breaks. And that's the way that we overcome that activation energy, the energy barrier. So increasing the temperature increases the average kinetic energy of the particles and increasing the temperature will increase the number of molecules with sufficient energy to overcome the barrier. So we've looked at this graph before, um, th how the proportion of molecules kind of follows this normal distribution, except it has a long tail on the end here. And the long tail on the end shows us that when I have zero kinetic energy, I have zero molecules with that energy. But if on average I have this much kinetic energy, my particle, I have the, the highest number of particles that have this much kinetic energy, so this is kind of my average right here, then that means that I'll have some particles that have higher energy than that, and I'll have some particles that have lower energy than that. And what happens when I heat up a sample, here's a low temperature, T1, and here's a higher temperature, T2, this temperature is higher. So the average kinetic energy of T1 at the low temperature is right about here, in the middle, but the average kinetic energy of T2 is right about here at the higher temperature. It has higher average kinetic energy. And not only that, but the tail over here has gotten more spread out so that the yellow part, the part that is available where the particles have enough energy to overcome the barrier, right? So here they don't have enough energy, they don't have enough, don't have enough, don't have enough, don't have enough. Finally, right here, they have enough to overcome that activation barrier there's a higher proportion of molecules based on this graph at higher temperatures. And if I heated this up again, then I would make another curve that would kind of go like this. And if I heated it up again, I would make another curve that would kind of go like this. Right? And so each time I'm getting more particles that are under that curve that have enough energy to overcome the activation barrier. So as I heat it up more and more and more, there will be a higher proportion of particles, not all of them, but a lot of them will have enough energy to overcome the activation barrier. So we can also um, plot the Arrhenius equation by converting this into the form of a line, like we've been doing a bunch throughout this chapter. So remember, y equals mx plus b. So this is the form of a line. So what would I plot? If I was looking at this equation and I was going to make a plot so that I could see a line and get some information from it, how would I do that? Well, first, let's write it out like this and remind ourselves what we're looking at. This is a line, right? Y equals mx plus b. So this is y, this is m, this is x, and this is b. So if I was going to plot this, what would I plot on the, on the y-axis? Well, I would plot the natural log of k on the y-axis. What would I plot on the x-axis? Well, I would plot 1 over t on the x-axis. And where would these values come in? Well, remember, m is the slope of a line, and b is the y-intercept of the line, where it crosses the y-axis. So um, the this right here is going to be the slope of the line, and the y-intercept is going to be uh, where that line crosses y. So we might have a line that looks like this. So remember that the slope is 
how uh, whether the line is kind of pointing down or whether the line is pointing up. So the extent to which this line is either flat or pointing down or pointing up is called the slope. And if I know the values of natural log k and 1 over t and I've produced this line, then I can uh, solve for m, multiply that, multiply the slope by r, and then I can solve for the gas constant. Or excuse me, then I can solve for the activation energy. So all I have to do to solve for the activation energy when I'm using an Arrhenius plot is generate this line, solve for m, and multiply by r. Because then I would have this value, right? r times negative ea over r and r and r will cancel and that would give me negative ea that would give me well at least the negative of the activation energy so then I multiply by negative 1 to calculate the activation energy and ln a that's right here right? ln of a is where it crosses where this line crosses the y-axis If we only have two points, we can still make a line. It's not going to be a particularly accurate line, but two points is better than one point, and three points would be better than that, and four points would be better, and so on and so on. The more data points we have, the more accurate our information is going to be. But if we only have two data points, we can still make a line. Um, and in fact, rather than making a line and plotting it, because that would be kind of a waste of time to make a plot it only had two points. We would just use this equation. This is called the two-point form. So if I only have two values of k and I only have two values of t, then rather than making a plot, I'll make, I'll just plug those values into this equation. And then I can solve for Ea the same way. Right? I plug my, my values for k in and have a, a numerical value over here. Plug my values for t in and have a numerical value over here. And then multiply by r so I could get the activation energy, calculate the activation energy. So the collision theory of kinetics says that for most reactions, for a reaction to take place, the reacting molecules must collide with each other. So in order for A and B to turn into C and D, they've got to run into each other. So part of, there's a lot of particles and they move pretty quickly. So on average, we've got about a billion collisions per second, 10 to the 9 collisions per second. Once molecules collide, they might react and they might not react, depending on two factors. So whether the collision has enough energy to break the bonds holding reactant molecules together, that's the activation energy, and whether the reacting molecules collide in the proper orientation for new bonds to form, that's the frequency factor. So let's We've looked at the activation energy a bit. They have to bump into each other and have enough energy to break the bond. Let's look a little bit more at the frequency factor. All right, so here's an example of a reaction. A plus B, C, uh, and when the A and runs into the B, C, the A and the B will make a bond, and the bond between the B and the C will break. So let's watch that happen. All right, so we're, we're, give, we're gonna give the A some kinetic energy here. Boom, and it hits C. As the A hits this B, C, the bond breaks and the C is released. But then as the C comes back and hits the B, A, the, the reverse reaction takes place. The C hits the B here and makes this bond and it releases the A, right? So they kind of go back and forth like that. So let's reset that again and look for one more minute at first when this reaction is occurring it's only going to occur in this one dimension so we can see it go back and forth so what we're seeing here is that this has a perfect frequency factor a frequency factor of one and the reason that it's so perfect is because the only collisions that can take place are collisions that are perfectly aligned in order for this reaction to take place the yellow ball has to hit the purple ball 180 degrees behind the gray ball. It has to hit the purple ball right here. If the yellow ball hits the purple ball right here, it won't have a reaction. This won't have a reaction. This won't have a reaction. This won't have a reaction. It won't have a reaction unless it hits anywhere except right here, 180 degrees away from the gray one. 
So that's the only spot. Oh, I don't think I gave it enough energy, did I? Nope. See, there was not enough activation energy. If the particle is not going fast enough and it doesn't have enough activation energy, then even if it's a perfect collision, there's not enough energy to break the bond between the reactant particles. So we need to reset and I need to give this more energy. I need more energy to, to break the active, uh, to have activation energy. Oh, I still didn't give it enough. Reset it again. Now I'll give it more. Now it's got a lot of activation energy. Boom. Now it, the activation energy is high enough and the frequency factor, the, the orientation of the particles is perfect. The yellow one is hitting the purple one right in the right spot, and the gray one is hitting the purple one right in the right spot to cause the reverse reaction. But here after a minute, they're gonna expand out into the two dimensions of this box, and the orientation is not gonna be perfectly lined up during every collision. There we go. So now they have, they've, they're off course. Let's see if we can get them going faster here. And now when they collide, they're not going to collide with the right orientation. See? There wasn't the right orientation for the yellow one to stick to the purple one and break that bond. They collided, but they didn't collide with the right orientation. So now they've got a lot of energy, they're going fast. So if they collide, they definitely have enough kinetic energy. Uh, the activation energy is definitely high enough now, but now they have to hit each other with the right orientation in order for a reaction to occur. So both of these factors have to be met in order for a successful collision. Lots of collisions will happen. Lots of collisions will happen but not all of them will be successful. I will right, we'll put some, some reactants in there, raise the temperature, and watch that they're gonna collide fairly often, but not every collision is going to be a successful collision because they have to not only have enough energy, but they also have to have the right orientation. So look how often they collide without reacting. So the more complicated the orientation requirements become, the slower the reaction goes. So for particles that have a lot of atoms, for molecules that are really complicated, rates could be pretty slow because they have very high requirements for the orientation. The geometry at which these particles have to hit each other has to be just right in order for the reaction to occur. So energetic collision leads to a product. So they have to be going fast enough and they have to have the exact right orientation. Right, so here's the orientation effect. If the oxygen hits the oxygen, no reaction. But if the carbon hits the oxygen, then I can make a CO2. So not only do the particles have to bounce around and be going fast enough to break bonds, but they also have to hit each other in just the right spot in order to make the new product molecule. So these are what we call effective collisions. Effective collisions are those in which the two conditions are met. The higher the frequency of effective collisions, the faster the reaction rate, the faster reactant will turn to product. When two molecules have an effective collision, a temporary high energy chemical species is formed, the activated complex, or also called the transition state. The transition state is unstable, that's because it only exists for an instant. So once that transition state is formed, it's either going to fall apart and turn back into reactants, or it's going to fall apart and turn into products. So we've uh, looked a bit at this um, frequency factor A, and um, we can algebraically look into A even a bit further and show that um, that this frequency factor is a function of two things. So the orientation factor P is a statistical term relating to the frequency factor to the collision frequency. So there are two, there are two um, components of A, how often particles run into each other and how often uh, those particles have the proper orientation. So generally the more complex the reactant molecules, the smaller the value of P. So as P approaches one, then that means that every reaction is gonna be appropriately oriented. But as P approaches zero, that means that the 
almost none of the collisions are going to be appropriate, appropriately oriented and that a reaction is going to be very rare. So the proper orientation results when the atoms are aligned in such a way that the old bonds can break and the new bonds can form. And as we've seen, that might be a pretty specific geometry, a specific orientation. The more complex the reactant molecules, the less frequently they will collide with the proper orientation. Reactions where symmetry results in multiple orientations leading to a reaction have p slightly less than 1. So that just means when there are several possible ways in which the particles can successfully collide with the appropriate orientation um, because of symmetry, then p is going to approach 1 also. It's going to be fairly high. So for most reactions, though, this orientation factor is less than 1 because for most reactions, just like we saw with the, the billiard balls over here that are bouncing around, for most reactions, the yellow one's got to strike the purple one in exactly the right spot, and so on for other particles. So there are generally fairly specific orientation requirements for these particles for a reaction to occur. So here are a couple of other factors that can affect the rate. We've looked at um, the, uh, the concentration of the reactants. We've talked about the nature of the reactants, whether they're liquids or solids, um, whether they're big particles or small particles, whether they have lots of surface area or not. Um, so uh, generally, gases react faster than liquids, and liquids react faster than solids. Um, powders react faster than big chunks because they have higher cons uh, surface area. So if we increase the temperature, we increase the rate because the particles go faster. And if they go faster, they'll bump into each other with more energy. And if they do that, then uh, bonds between pro um, particles can be broken. And when bonds are broken, then new bonds can form and products can form. So increasing the temperature increases the rate. Increasing the concentration increases the rate because there are more particles in which to collide, leading to more effective collisions. And when I have more successful collisions, then the reaction rate increases.